So congratulations to um, to to Parasite. Thank you for thank you Freya and um, Cosmin for for having me and providing me with this opportunity to um, to share my experience with you and um, to learn about the endeavors of all my colleagues. And also hello again to this body of students who were so um, so eager to um, participate in uh, this seminar. Hmm? No, I don't need a spotlight. It's, it's not about me. Um, <clears throat> in this seminar that also proved for me quite a, quite a fruitful experience. I mean, to see that a young generation of would-be curators is uh, coming up, hopefully to, to challenge us soon. So I don't have much to contribute to, uh, to the topic of the, of the rise of China. I um, was glad to um, be able to share Ai Weiwei's effort to, uh, to bring it down, um, albeit in a sim symbolic fashion. And I was quite moved, I have to say, by, um, by what uh, P. Lee contributed in the beginning of his talk of uh, of a possibility, if I understood him right, to claim something of a socialist legacy for both China and uh, modernity. I was forced, out of respect for my host, to, um, to revisit the 10 years from 2000 to 2010, the Viennese art historian Otto Pecht coined the term uh, retrospective prophecy for the history of style that was um, <clears throat> invented in Vienna in the late 19th century and was or became one of the founding stones of art history understood as a discipline of Western academia with figures like Alois Riegel. I will come back to that in a minute. I would like to, um, to frame my own inter interventions within four more or less modest claims. First, that there is no West at least this is a perception from, from someone supposedly to be from the West. I mean, I'm not necessarily more, more stupid than you, so when we talk about the West, I know that we, that we share a common understanding. But I think um, there's, also an e there's also an element of afterlife to, to, to certain concepts and, uh, and a moment. And perhaps the 20th anniversary of Parasite is such a moment when it's really time to, to wave goodbye to those things. The second is that globalization never happened. Again, I know what we are talking about or what you are talking about when you name globalization for the umpteenth time. I just want to point out that there is a prehistory more often than not, not overlooked to, um, to globalization happening in, in modern terms. I think it's fair to say that, the, that there were always trade routes, connections, migrant flows, whatever, accidents between the major cultural geographies. Third, artwork equals the exhibition form. This is an 
argument that is largely derived out of out of a reading and out of discussion with my with my close friend, the philosopher Peter Osborne, and his account of uh, post conceptual art or art under post conceptual conditions. I always found it um, unsatisfactory just to diagnose that installation art happened, like as if it fell from, from Mars. Its emergence has a reason, and this reason is, um, is connected to the global transnational. I cannot go into, into the details of, uh, of this argument, but in, it entails um, a Marxist reading of, of history and requires a proper understanding of, of capital and capital accumulation. Which brings us to, to my fourth claim, that capital no longer needs a bourgeoisie. So it has emancipated itself from, from a sort of uh, national elite that was well known in uh, Victorian England, for example, or in Germany in the, in the, in the 20s. And this has affected all the institutions that were sustained by that very bourgeoisie, which is the museum system and the system of, of higher education. And we are affected, I mean, both by the mobility or by the dynamics of, uh, of this change and and I fear the art world to be chased like rabbits actually by uh, by capital feeling um, a need to obey to the to the newest fashion both when it comes to adopting exhibition models artist names forms of uh, display forms of, of discourse and I think that this is something that needs to be quite consciously rejected and that also needs, probably requires another form of institutional solidarity than the one we have now. I don't know if this transnational Biennale network can ever become such a forum, but um, let's try. So starting First, with the, with the non-West. I mean, growing up or be, being educated through Viennese art history does not deny that, um, <clears throat> that there were centers of power, changing, of course, um, uh, over the time. But still, those large hegemonic hegemonic trust that are the effects of certain discourses or, or arguments tend to disappear if you start to look closer. Alois Riegel, the, the, the founding father of, of Viennese history, wrote an important book in which he, tr in which he traced the, the history of style through the times making clear that this European self-fabrication of, um, <clears throat> of being a civilization that is founded by Hellenistic and, uh, and, and Roman thought, forms, and principles is, is largely wrong. Connecting um, those forms, and this looks at first sight like an innocent or innocuous or decorative element, looks inside for, uh, instead for the, for the Islamic element and for something that was not coined at the time but could be called a global connectedness that related Spain, for example, to the, to the Arab world. Besides the discourse, there's also uh, an abundance of, of artifacts. I mean, European powers have amassed 
over the uh, over the centuries stuff from basically everywhere and what you can what you can feel i mean if you if you visit those places those museums not just as an as an observer or as a as a consumer but as someone who's looking for the for the for the glitches is that this categorical system that from the 19th century on um, tried to articulate museological experience collapses easily under its own burden. So you have those, you have categories, you have geographical categories like China, Persia, Latin America, um, Europe, Western Europe, and so on and so forth. And you have also those silly chronologies or, or timelines that suggest that um, Korea in 1680 was France in, in, in 6080. I mean, all those things tend to disappear or lose their, their plausibility if you start to follow the trajectories of not all of, but of some of the pieces or some of the objects more closely. So I'm arguing here also for a sort of materialist history of the art object and of some kind of um, material resistance to um, epistemological appropriation. This is just a look at the Pitt Rivers Museum in, in Oxford. This is a kind of ethnographic museum. It shows the greed, but also the madness of the, um, of the ambition to, um, <clears throat> to acquire things, to, to accumulate stuff. And it does not look, and, but, but I think that this basic instinct, I mean, to accumulate stuff, is not so different from, from the kind of shopping sprees art fairs nowadays um, entice. So the question then for, um, and I was probably your age, I mean, when, when, when I was puzzled with, with, with those phenomena, is how to, how to, how to proceed. You can proceed, and it's probably the only way. I mean, the the the, the visual arts supply supply by visual affinities, by formal correspondences, and I give you an example of uh, of what I have in mind. I mean, those are slides which I had used um, I don't, 10, 15 years ago, and just revisited. I mean, yesterday, in order to prepare this talk. On the on the right, you have a detail. I mean, the hand with a cord of a of a fresco painted in the Palazzo Publico in the 14th century by Ambrogio Lorenzetti. It's an allegory of the bad and good government. On the on the left, you have the emergency staircase of um, Niemeyer's Edificio Copan in. Uh, in Sao Paulo. So this is a, um, a Brazilian landmark modernist building with the, with the staircase or the emergency staircase seemingly suggesting a way out of modernity. Here you have a more detailed shot which also gives you an, an idea of the, of the singularity that fills up the, the modules provided by modern standards. And this is, of course, also the kind of singularity um, artists are, are looking for. And, uh, and almost the opposite, an interior space um, inside the, the city hall of Siena, which was at that time a state republic in competition with, um, with Florence, where you had, and this is quite fascinating, a very abstract notion of government. So where, where government or, or power was not about, um, about people 
or a person, but it was about abstract principles. I mean, like concordia, unity, or, or harmony. And the court was a stand-in, because it passed from one citizen to, to the other, thus connecting the, um, the civility of the city. So this unity is almost imperceptible, but it's there if you look, look closely. This is a detail of a, of a photograph by, um, by Litwin van der Veen that dates back also, I mean, 15 years or so. It was photographed on the, on the threshold, on the, on the steps of City Hall in, in Amsterdam. And what you have here is a, is a group of Moroccan youth. They wanted to take part in, an, in a demonstration against the, the Gulf War and uh, wanted to burn an American flag, but they were shunned from, uh, from joining the demonstration by, by the organizers. So here have, you have a group of people where precisely this, this court or the unity is missing, or where the possibility of forming a unity is frustrated. But those affinities or visual affinities, what we called um, in the beginning of, uh, of the research for, for Documenta 12, the migration of form is not just um, a personal vision or an act of, of imagination. It is also an empirical fact. This is a facade of a mosque in, in Lagos. And if you can retrace in uh, Regal's fashion the forms that um, define this mosque, then you, would found, then you would find orthodox elements from Portuguese Baroque. The same as in this first image, which I had shown, I mean, the stone relief, which comes from the Umayyad Mosque in uh, Damascus. I mean, this was uh, early on, I mean, the fourth century, a Roman temple, and then it was turned into a Christian basilica before it, before it became a mosque. And for some century, it also functioned. As a, as a place or as a site of shared beliefs of Christians and Muslims, and where you could also detect Roman, Hellenistic, and um, Islamic elements. But again, uh, to come back, I mean, to, to, to this facade. So those kinds of, of monuments are not the exception, but, but rather the rules. I mean, monument, artworks, or just monument of civil interaction that speak not one language, so, so much about identity, but two or three or four. And if you, <clears throat> and if you go after those, um, those ornaments and try to lineate this trajectory, then you would get into a very complex history that has, of course, to do with the, um, with the West African slave trade, with uh, sugar plantations in, uh, on the Brazilian coast around the, um, the first Portuguese capital in Brazil, Salvador. You would detect a whole economy based on exchange, on an overcoming of uh, religious belief, because 
the Portuguese were totally unaware that the tribes, people, they shipped to, um, to Brazil were in fact uh, Muslims or at least to a, to a large degree because this part of Africa was already conquered by, by the Arabs in the 11th and, uh, and 12th centuries. So the Muslims managed to, to organize themselves quite well and mount some kind of social resistance against the plantation or, or slave economy. And, um, and this capacity to unite helped them to get kicked out. And they founded the first truly independent countries on the West African coast, but also spilled to other territories. I mean, it's not Liberia alone, but also to um, <coughs> Benin, and in this case, to, to Lagos. And since they had to build, or since they acquired over generation, the skill of Portuguese craftsmen in working with wood and working with tiles, they applied the style, of course, or those crafts to the buildings they wanted to build. And in this case, the mosque in, in Lagos. But the histories pertaining to formal migrations, where forms pertains both to aesthetic or artistic forms and also to social forms. And, and where it makes actually no sense to talk about culture, because it's, it's a term much too loose to, um, to capture what is, what is going on here, does not always come with a, with a dramatic history of political upheavals. It is also connected to, to trade and to, um, to the interplay of demand and supply. So I show you here two, um, <clears throat> no, on the left, I mean, it both look like um, blue and white porcelain. The left is, so this is around 1700, Kangxi rain produced for the French market at a time when the, when the Chinese held the monopoly on, on porcelain production and when the Europeans were still not capable to make porcelain on, on their own. I mean, this would still last another 150 years. This is also a dramatic history because, um, <clears throat> because it um, caused the European power massive trade imbalances, which were then later corrected with the, with the opium wars and, um, and the taking over of, um, of the Chinese coastline. And on the right, you have um, a Persian example. So this is um, around, this 16, yeah, around 1600, where a local elite, I mean, people or the elites then too, we are, we are basically inclined to, to own the same things. Um, we are not capable of acquiring China proper. And thus Persian craftspeople reverted to uh, what could be called replicas. But the replicas are fascinating insofar as I mean, of course, they have a different um, physical appearance. They are much heavier. But also the way, I mean, the, 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 the ornament is, is rendered, displays something of a, um, of a local sensibility or a familiarity of form that is definitely un-Chinese. And especially the ideographs, the Chinese letters, are unreadable, both to the Chinese and to the Persians. But, but they are good enough. Now, if you try to um, 
do justice to the complexity of exchanges in, in history, exchanges between cultural geographies that reproduce themselves more often implicitly than explicitly in, in forms, in artifacts, in objects, in everyday objects, as well as in, in, in high art. What kind of uh, methodology do you arrive at, finally? I think this methodology will be, above all, open, porous, precarious, irresponsible, risky, speculative, impossible. It will have to ask its visitor at every move, I mean, is this serious? Because you can claim reflection. I mean, this is one thing, and it has become a well-worn formula in, in, in our circles. But it's an altogether different matter than to make people reflect. But I think you only make people reflect if you throw them into a kind of intellectual abyss where they can no longer master what they encounter. But this is only a fair share, I mean, of your own experience or of your own journey through global complexities. So I will give you a, one example of, of the idea that, um, that formed in this decade Parasite was asked me to, to, to focus on. This is a constellation. And as I said, or as I stated in the, in the beginning, that the artwork equals the exhibition form. It means that you have no longer a singular piece that can do justice to this kind of complexity. I mean, to this kind of meeting of incompatible realities. I mean, you have no longer a single piece that can pretend to be, be coherent. And this is also, and this points also to the, to the, to a discrepancy. I want to come back later, or perhaps in the discussion between the, the form of the artwork on an eye-to-eye -eye level with our contemporary condition and the commodity form that is presented at the art fair or also at exhibitions which don't invest proper time, I mean, to set up the things as they belong or as they, as they should be, and instead um, opt for the thing. But the thing is no more. Also, I mean, it needs to be mentioned before I, I, I go into this this puts us on a, on a kind of uncanny, an uncanny situation, I mean, talking as a curator, between the claim or the aesthetic claim of an artwork or the claim for art's autonomy and what exhibitions tend to do with artworks, turning them into something beyond what they are or into something beyond their material appearance. I have no answer to this, except that exhibitions are temporary. They disappear. They don't haunt you. I mean, there's a, I think Godard once wrote in his diary that he is haunted or even tortured by, by early bad films of his, because people can see them again and again. 
I mean, this is never going to happen with an exhibition, thank God. And this is also one of the reasons to, to stay in this, in this business. So what I want to show you here is a, th a constellation of, of three objects, three things, with a very different character. Up front, you have uh, bridal veils from uh, Central Asia. They also date back four or five centuries. Those are traditional forms. I won't delineate them for, for you, but you can you have an idea now what, what my argument would be. Then on the left, you have a mandala painting by, uh, by John McCracken. I mean, the mandala painting is also, I mean, when it comes to Tibetan monks and this kind of meditation through paintings where it's not about the object itself or the painting, but about the process. So where the object that results from the process is not so important as the process itself, so the things get discarded. But in this case, it was kept. It's from the early 70s, and it uh, belongs to what the Californians called <coughs> euphemistically the summer of love. And on the right, you have, uh, um, you have a sequence of, of photographs from the early 80s by, by David Goldblatt called The Transported from Quan de Bele. So this is how a bridal veil looks. The important thing, um, I mean, to keep in mind, because you cannot see this or you cannot experience it spatially, is the slit for, for the eyes, this threshold between uh, what is visible and what is invisible. And this was a technique of government, basically, uh, of the uh, apartheid regime in South Africa. To have this workforce um, going from the townships to the, uh, to the city center of Joburg, traveling per day three or four hours per bus in the morning and going back three or four hours per hours at, at night. So you had people consciously, politically, turned into absentees on, a, on the level of their consciousness, but also on the, on the level of their psychic and uh, political mobilization. This is a, just a detail of one of those um, silly small paintings done by McCracken in the early 70s. And you could ask, I mean, what's the connection between those two? And there is probably no one, except when it comes to, when it comes to look beyond the, the photograph and its political immediacy and the and the painting and its artistic idiocy at, um, at a focus on what consciousness can do or cannot do when it comes to human action. The veil and the slit I mentioned and now I come back to this example. So you have pieces that would defy any possible museological category. I mean, you can always argue, of course, that in contemporary terms, it doesn't matter. People are used, I mean, when they walk through, a, through an art fair or through the conventional type Biennale, that the stuff is somehow accumulated and sometimes accidentally communication happens, the same as you meet a friend at a, at a gallery booth, but maybe you only need strangers. So the question is then beyond going for the, for the accident and going for 
the impossibility or stating the impossibility of, uh, of communication. I mean, is there a way to, to proceed along those lines? Does it make sense, I mean, to connect the photograph with the, through the bridal veils? I mean, does it help to sensitize a viewer just by visual association for the impact of the, of the photograph, of what it means to make people invisible? Because this is basically what apartheid is about, of making people invisible and reconnecting this to the dialectics of visibility and invisibility in gender terms when it comes to the bridal veil. Does it make sense, I mean, to make such a proposition? Does it make sense to connect the ornament on the bridal veil with the mandala, with the ornament on the mandala by John McCracken? And actually, I have to say, I don't know. I don't know. It's in... Uh, it's a sort of um, experiment, open heart, but, um, but I feel that this is the attitude that is required actually from, from us, speaking from a curatorial position, by the risk undertaken by the artist in his or her studio. Now to finish this, we can use the fact that due to um, a very elaborate critique that went on in the last 30 or 40 years, we can use the fact that the museum is no longer a safe environment. I think the the administration of the museum, or the curatorial administration, and probably also the administration of capital is, if we look properly at the possibilities spaces provide us with, are no longer capable of controlling what's going on on their, on their premises. You cannot make a, a difference between a Hans Hacke sort of institutional critique and the way um, patrons nowadays uh, signify, I mean, their, their donation to, to the institution. And I think that this is precisely talking from a standpoint of, of Western institution, I mean, even uh, succumbing to the seemingly contradiction, the way forward. So I think that we have to do is to, to claim museum spaces, official institutions, and to um, undo them. Thank you.